welcome to this next installment of the Patients Program Summer Roundtable Series. Um, I'm really excited today for this panel. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Eleanor Perfetto, our facilitator and moderator, uh, to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Welcome to everyone. Um, I want to I um, want to tell you how excited I am about this panel of four FDA speakers. You know, the Patients Program does a tremendous amount of work um, in patient engagement and patient centricity. And a lot of that work has to do with um, engagement in research and engagement in their own health. Um, and today we're going to talk about a slightly different aspect of patient engagement than what the Patients Program usually deals in, and that's in the regulatory aspect. So in the U.S., we have the Food and Drug Administration. It's very involved in the regulation of food and medical products, and they also have some patient engagement programs specifically to increase patient engagement in medical product development. We're going to hear about that today, and um, we have uh, four, four women from four different parts of the organization. They're going to talk about their role and what their different centers and what their different divisions do, and um, I am excited to introduce them to you. So we're going to begin with Robin Bent. Robin is the uh, Patient-Focused Drug Development Program Director, and that's in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, which is called CEDAR for short. We also have Karen Jackler. Karen is the Patient Engagement Program Manager, and she's in the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. So that's called CBER for short, and you'll hear those acronyms today, but you'll hear them use. We have Saad Nakatri, who is the Regulatory Officer in the Pro Professional Affairs and Stakeholder Engagement Staff. And she is also in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research in CEDAR. And then we have Michelle Tarver. She's the Deputy Director of the Office of Strategic Partnerships and Technology Innovation. And that's in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And that's called CDRH. So you'll hear those acronyms um, used this afternoon. And if you need to refer back to them to remember what they are, you can just look at their titles and you'll see them in those titles. So um, what, I, what I wanna do this afternoon is begin by giving each speaker an opportunity to open up with a little bit of background on um, what their uh, part of the FDA organization is doing in patient engagement in medical product development. And after they give their overview, then we're gonna jump into a Q&A session. I'm gonna ask them some questions. We're gonna have a, from some free flow of conversation. And then we'll also be taking in the questions that you ask from the audience um, and you can put those in the Q&A box, of course, at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, and in the chat, you can um, ask, you can direct any questions or technical issues that you might be having. And then also our speakers will be adding, adding some things to the chat that they might wanna share with you in terms of um, a URL or other links that they might wanna share. So um, Robin, I'm gonna begin with you. You're first on the list here. So I'm gonna begin with you um, and I'm gonna turn, the, the, turn it over to you now. Hey, thanks so much. So as, as Eleanor mentioned, my name is Robin Bent. I'm the Director of Patient-Focused Drug Development um, here in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the US FDA. And I'm um, really excited to be here today to talk to you a little bit about our Patient-Focused Drug Development Program. And so I just wanted to start maybe briefly by touching on FDA's role in, in drug development. And so one of our missions is to protect and of course promote the public health by evaluating the safety and effectiveness of new drugs. And while we play a critical role in the process, um, the reality is we don't actually develop the drugs and we don't um, conduct the trials. We also are not able to kind of make pick companies develop a drug, even when we see if there is a need. However, we do play a role in kind of guiding these efforts. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that as, as, I, as I move forward. But first I wanna talk a little bit about patient-focused drug development which is really a systematic approach to help ensure that patients' experiences, perspectives, needs, and priorities are captured and meaningfully incorporated into drug development and evaluation. Patient-focused drug development started in about um, 2012, so a little bit later than patient engagement at FDA. Um, but in 2012, when FDA agreed to enhance our benefit risk framework. And so um, just as a little bit of a background, to be approved for marketing, a drug must be found to be safe and effective for its intended use. And although the meaning of safe is not um, explicitly defined in the statutes or regulations that govern approval and recognizing that, of course, all drugs have some ability to cause adverse effects, the safety of a drug is assessed by determining whether its benefits outweigh its risks. And so this benefit risk assessment is the basis of um, our FDA's regulatory decisions in the pre-market and post-market review process. 
And so this takes into account um, a lot of things, the extensive evidence of safety and effectiveness submitted by the sponsor as part of a new drug application or biologics application, as well as many other factors affecting the benefit risk assessment, including the nature and severity of the condition the drug is intended to treat or to prevent, the benefits and risks of other available therapies for the condition, and um, any risk management tools that um, might be necessary to ensure that the benefits of the drug outweigh its risks. And this assessment involves both um, qualitative analyses and um, some more subjective, maybe quantitative weighing of the evidence. And so we use um, this benefit risk framework for human drug review to kind of to kind of look at all of that. And so when we agreed to enhance the benefit risk assessment, we, we agreed to um, like multiple different things. And one of the one was to talk to patients and their caregivers with a specific disease so that they could help us to better understand experiences of patients living with a condition or kind of the therapeutic context. And so we did this by conducting um, 24 disease specific public meetings. Um, we've subsequently um, conducted many more, um, but these are our patient focused drug development meetings. And these meetings provide really us with an important opportunity to hear directly from patients, patient advocates and caregivers about the symptoms that mattered most to them, the impact the disease has on their daily life and patients experiences with current, excuse me, currently available treatments. And so of course, what we heard reinforced in many ways, what we already knew that patients are the real experts on, the, on their condition, but also that what we think matters to patients isn't always what matters to patients and that sometimes the most obvious symptoms are not the most bothersome symptoms. And perhaps one of our more, more important discoveries was that sometimes the endpoints that are being measured in clinical trials don't really reflect what matters to patients. And of course, we also learned that patients want to be as active as possible in work to develop and evaluate new treatments. And so we held these meetings and we learned a lot from them, but um, that didn't really get us kind of far enough, right? So we started hearing from stakeholders that we needed to do more. And we wanted and needed to kind of move beyond that, the powerful and compelling narratives that we were hearing as part of these patient-focused drug development meetings. Um, so it was kind of time for our next steps. So around this time, we started to include a statement of patient experience um, in our review documents to develop a glossary of terms used in patient-focused drug development to create a repository to collect patient experience data, such as the, um, the voice of the patient reports from PFDD meetings. And we started to develop several guidance documents. And so the motivation for these guidance documents really was um, that we know the use of patient experience data in medical product development is an evolving field. And because of this, we see variable quality of patient experience data. Um, so in order to provide transparency and really increased predictability to sponsors, we're developing, and when I say, say we, I mean it's a, it's a, it's a cross-center kind of effort, a series of methodologic guidance documents. Um, and this series will take our stakeholders from planning a study to collect patient input all the way through incorporating clinical outcome assessments into clinical trial endpoints. Also, as I mentioned earlier, we heard from patients that sometimes the endpoints being measured in trials aren't the endpoints that matter to them. So we've launched the, um, the standard core clinical outcome assessment and related endpoints grant program, which will enable the development of these standard core sets of measures of disease burden and treatment burden for a, gift, a given area, and they'll be made publicly available. And of course, we do a lot of outreach because PFDD is about science, but it's also about culture change, right? So because of this, we really believe that PFDD is something that shouldn't just be brought in um, at the time a drug is being submitted for review, but it really needs to be kind of thought about early in the process when drug developers are thinking about developing a drug treatment, when they're designing their clinical trials. Are the trials designed in a way um, to decrease participant burden? Are they measuring things that matter to patients? Are the inclusion and exclusion criteria reasonable or do they exclude too many people who will likely take the product if it's approved? And to be honest, um, I think we, I've been pretty impressed about how medical product developers have been open to PFDD. I mean, I think there's always room for improvement, but I do think that we're, we're on the right track. And of course, we're seeing more and more um, patient groups being involved in the medical product development process, which is really, really wonderful. But again, as with kind of most patient engagement, the key to patient-focused drug development is really to kind of start early, build relationships and trust, and really listen to the perspectives of, of stakeholders. And so um, with that, I just want to thank you for coming today, and I look forward to our discussion and any questions later in the session.
Thanks. My name is Karen Jackler, and I'm in the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. And my role here is the uh, Patient Engagement Program Manager. And for those of you not familiar with what CEBA regulates, I'll just sort of give you, uh, like, I think the, the products you're probably most familiar with are vaccines, stem cells, and gene therapy. So that's sort of where I'm coming from in terms of patient engagement. Um, my role here is in, in a lot of ways um, to support and, and help the people in my office access the incredible programs that you're gonna hear about today. Um, Robin just told you um, a lot about the PFDD work. You're gonna hear a lot from, from Dr. Tarver and from, and from, Dr., um, from, from Sadhana Khatri about the work that they do. Um, CBER is, um, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a smaller group. And so we, we, we haven't launched our own patient engagement initiatives, but we, are, um, we work very closely with the people here. Um, as you can imagine, Michelle, Sadna, and Robin and I actually talk quite a bit. Um, and I think that might come up later in the, um, about how we work together. But um, in a nutshell, so my role is inside the Center for Biologics to make sure that the people in my, the people that I work with, the, the review staff and the statistical staff and, and anybody who's interested in patient engagement can access the information that is available on them. And also to make sure that I understand what's going on in the different centers so that I can be sort of successful in making sure people understand that. And I also have a big role in um, working with patient groups um, as well. So that's, that's another big part of my role. So I'm actually going to let other people tell you about the fantastic programs here at FDA. And I, you'll hear more from me later, for sure. Thank you. So Dr. Profeto, thank you for the introductions and welcome to each and every one of you. And I'm really excited to be here today. So as Dr. Profeto mentioned, I also work in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research with my colleague, Robin Bent, and it is in short called CEDAR. So before I go into discussing what I do in my office, I will start with the mission of CEDAR. So CEDAR's mission is to promote and protect the public health by ensuring that safe and effective drugs are available to all Americans. And this is very succinct mission statement, but it does encompass a lot of activities. So CEDAR routinely consults with American people in making its decision about drugs that they use. It holds public meetings to incorporate expert and consumer input into its decisions. The center also announces many of its decisions in advance so that members of the public, academia, industry, trade associations, consumer groups, and professional societies can comment and make suggestions before decisions become final. So in addition, CEDAR also holds public meetings with consumers and patient groups, professional societies, and pharmaceutical trade associations to obtain enhanced public input into its planning and priority setting practices. Over the years, policies have changed and laws have gotten stronger, but the center's present and future mission remains constant to ensure that the benefits of drug products made available to the public outweigh all known risks. So ultimately, patients are the focus of all CEDAR activities and we need to engage with them. So now let's start with where the opportunities for engagement. So this has changed over the last decade since I have been involved in the drug development. So patient input, as my colleague Robin and Karen mentioned, is playing an important role and increasing role in development and regulation of medical products. So first I will talk about my office and its role in patient engagement. So professional affairs and stakeholder engagement staff, which is in short called PACES, in CEDAR leads engagement activities with non-regulated stakeholders across CEDAR, facilitating dialogue and collaboration between patients, their advocates, healthcare providers, professional associations, and CEDAR staff. So our mission is to enrich the experience of patients, advocacy groups, healthcare professionals, and agencies in engaging with CEDAR, and also to improve our stakeholders' drug regulatory insight and understanding. The stakeholder groups are wide ranging, which you already heard from me before, could be ranging from patient advocacy groups, professional organization, academia, healthcare professional organizations, and trade organizations. 
So PACES is really in the middle and poised to be in the middle between CEDAR leadership and our stakeholders. So we act as conduit into the center for stakeholder concerns, viewpoints, and ideas. We enhance stakeholders, which we refer to as non-sponsors, awareness of the center's current thinking. We also promote collaborative actions regarding issues of mutual concern. So within PACE, we fulfill many functions related to stakeholder engagement. But for, for the purpose of this talk, I will only focus on patient engagement programs. So starting with targeted outreach communication program and stakeholder calls, we use these programs to keep our stakeholders informed about agency's current thinking and decisions. Through targeted outreach, we electronically push out agency's information out quickly to a range of stakeholder groups that they amplify the message to their membership. PACE also coordinates and moderates stakeholder calls, which are held between the CEDAR subject matter experts and stakeholder groups when the FDA has an important message to convey to a particular audience that aligns with the CEDAR actions. Core of our work is engagement with stakeholders and strength and dialogue with the general public and patients in particular. So patients are at the heart of PACE's work in CEDAR. So a, a very big activity, which I'm gonna share with you is also an opportunity for engagement with CEDAR is through the listening sessions, which allows FDA staff to hear directly from patients and caregivers about their experiences living with and managing a disease or a condition. So listening sessions, they were built on provisions in both the 21st Century Cures Act of 2016 and the Food and Drug Administration Reauthorization Act of 2017. So CEDAR's participation and listening session demonstrate our commitment to expanding stakeholder engagement as a consideration during our regulatory efforts. Patient voice is important to us because patients, they bring insight to a disease. Patients provide insight on issues, problems, and our questions that are important to patients and the family members and their caregivers. We also recognize not just one patient represents the whole patient community of particular disease. Patients have a vested interest and diversity of opinions, varied perspectives, both in terms of risk tolerance and potential benefit. So it's important to direct, to identify what matters, what is important to patients. So we highly value patient engagement and its contributions to the development of drug products. Patient input can direct drug development in many ways, helps with the understanding of the disease and their impact, helps identification of specific symptoms that are significant to patients. So we want to hear from you and it might also support drug development more broadly, identify areas of unmet need in the patient population, identify or develop tools that assess benefits of potential therapies, also raise awareness and channel engagement within the patient community. So I'm really excited again to be here and I look forward to our upcoming discussion and I will hand it over to Dr. Profeto. Thank you. Thank you. So Michelle, you're last but certainly not least. Well, I'm really honored to be here and thank you for letting me be able to take up the rear. So I'm gonna ask Joe, if you wouldn't mind sharing some slides that I think the visuals for me, I'm a visual learner. So I, I apologize if you hate slides, but I thought it'd be a good way for us to summarize a couple of points. As you heard from my colleagues, you know, we are all very much committed to ensuring that the patient's voice is reflected in the work that we do. At the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, we are focused on those types of uh, products that are devices. And devices include things such as the diagnostic test that you've probably heard a lot about with respect to COVID-19. Um, it includes contact lenses, MRI machines and CAT scanners, as well as implantable pacemakers, uh, lenses implanted for cataract surgery, as well as the tongue depressors or eye vision charts you may see in the clinic. So a huge array of products are, are what we regulate in our center. Next slide. And so I think as we're thinking about the patient's patient engagement and patient perspective, I think the first take home point is that it's important to consider it across the total product life cycle. Whether you're talking about the conceptualization of a medical device or a drug or biologic, as you've heard from my colleagues, or you're looking at the usability testing in terms of the interface of how that product will be engaging with the patient, or you're talking about the clinical trial or the post-market surveillance at every single node along this continuum, it's an opportunity for us to engage with patients. 
our center put out a guidance this year that spoke specifically to that point, that patient engagement is not a one-time transactional effort, but is something that should be considered across the pro total product life cycle at various stages. Next slide. The second point that I thought would be helpful to highlight is the importance of, of aligning on language. Um, there's something different when we're talking about engagement and something different when we're talking about structured data collection. And both elements of interfacing with patients is critically important. You heard Robin then speak about the patient-focused drug development guidances, and those are really getting at how do we get structured collection of data from patients about what it's like to live with their medical condition or interface with a medical product. So allow us to understand how patients feel, function, and survive. And that I think is really critical for us to, to know what we mean when we're talking about engaging with patients. Engaging with patients, at least how we've uh, understood it in our center, is those intentional, meaningful interactions that we have from patients that provide us an opportunity to learn from one another and to collaborate together. It, it may not necessarily be those structured data collections that we do in a clinical trial. So, Harmonizing on language is really important so that we all know what we are looking for as we're interacting, asking for interactions from one another um, and can appropriately set expectations. Next slide. The, the next point that I think is really important is that we transparently convey how impactful patients working with the agency can be. On this slide, you see that, that um, industry has involved patients in a number of different efforts to better understand the performance of their medical devices. We have currently 25 industry-sponsored patient preference studies that have been either completed or in the pipeline. And over 50% of our studies that have clinical data include some measure of how a patient feels or functions. But the one point that I wanted to highlight on this slide is that one of our our patient preference studies that was conducted, it was not conducted by FDA, it was conducted by industry, but it was inspired by patients at a workshop who said to the medical device industry, we want a device that we can use at home without having to have another caregiver present. And the industry listened to it, did a patient preference study, shared that with FDA. And not only did they do that preference study, they did it in collaboration with patients share the results with FDA, and that led to an expanded labeled indication for that particular device. So it's a way that we can clearly see that patient input is going to move the needle in terms of our regulatory efforts. Next slide. The last two slides are really kind of emphasizing the importance of creating mechanisms, ways in which patients can predictably interact with the FDA. One is our Patient Engagement Advisory Committee. It's the only committee like it at the agency that is comprised solely of patients, caregivers, and patient advocates. And they are an advisory committee, so they provide advice to FDA about various general complex scientific matters related to medical devices. On this slide, you can see some of the topics that we've discussed over the years, with the most recent one being uh, a couple of weeks ago on augmented and virtual reality devices. It's from these conversations that we understand where we might need to create clarity, transparency, and take some deliberate actions to improve um, uh, health outcomes in the patient populations that may be interacting with these medical devices. The next slide. And this slide is emphasizing again that not all interactions need to be formalized, but it helps when there's a clear approach to, um, to interacting with the agency. Our patient and caregiver connection is a way for our review staff really to get insights into um, what it's like to live with a medical condition or interface with that medical device, or are there certain challenges that are facing that particular patient community? Because our staff, they're comprised of clinicians, yes, and nurses and, and other healthcare providers, but it also may be toxicologists, chemists, engineers, people who may not have a lot of experience interfacing with patients or interacting with them. So better understanding their experience and hearing it directly from the patients can be quite beneficial in our work. Next slide. Not only do we as the agency really want to engage with patients as you've heard from all of us very, uh, very passionately, but we also encourage others who are doing collaborative efforts to include patients as part of that collaborative team. We have an initiative uh, that we had as one of our strategic priorities over the past few years on collaborative communities. And this was a grassroots movement where we encourage the public 
to find topics or areas that are challenging and work together, including all the stakeholders, as well as patients in that process to solve these shared challenges and come up with solutions that may meet everyone's needs. And currently we participate in 12 collaborative communities that touch on various different topics, as you can see on this slide. So collaboration is critical to that success. And the last slide is just a resource slide. It tells you where you can find additional information if you've got any questions about some of the programmatic work that we're doing at our center, as well as if you've got a specific question that you want to hear back from us on, you can mail, email our mailbox and we will return uh, that correspondence. And with that, I will take any questions, turn it back over to you, Dr. Picado. Thank you all very much for giving us, us those opening remarks to set the stage for the conversation that we're going to have. Um, I'm going to begin with a question that is for Karen. Karen, you started with some um, uh, with a listing of what um, the, the products or the types of products are from the CBER perspective. Could you outline those? And I think that there's probably uh, you could probably go on about all the new and cutting edge things that are happening, but I know that there are some other things that that you're we're working on um, and the aspects of those products, um, how it makes them a little different in patient engagement. Yeah, so as I mentioned, so I think sort of the top three that people are probably most familiar with are vaccines, stem cells, and, and gene therapies. And we also work on um, some maybe lesser known sort of therapies or, or things that are, are really still emerging, uh, xenotransplantation, which is the idea of bringing a, uh, a, a body part from a genetically modified animal into the human to sort of replace um, the function of you know, maybe a kidney or, or a heart. Those have actually been in the news somewhat lately. Um, phage therapy, which is, which is another <coughs> which is type of anti-infective. Um, so one of the things that were, um, and they all present their own challenges with, you know, phage therapy and xenotransplantation, transplantation, there's the challenges related to these being so cutting edge that people don't quite understand them yet. And so engaging with patients on that aspect is going to be very different from, say, a gene therapy, which people are more familiar with, but still don't quite have a full understanding of what that means or or what, um, or what a cure for, you know, a, you know, does a gene therapy cure or, or what does that mean? Um, and there's also, um, it, and with vaccines, the challenges there with patient engagement is that typically vaccines you're working on a healthy person. And so, you know, they're intended for healthy people versus a gene therapy where people are feeling, um, you know, there's a desperate need um, for them. So there's, it creates all kinds of challenges. And so one of the things that our Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies had, is working on um, is specifically to help people better understand the issues around gene therapies and, and, and stem cells, which are sort of under this um, greater sort of um, definition called regenerative therapy, regenerative therapies. Um, is a program called RegenMed Ed. And um, so there are sort of two components to RegenMed Ed at the moment. Um, one is um, a series of webinars, which are very sort of short and to the point um, series that bring together patients and caregivers, patient advocates and FDA staff to discuss sort of foundational information about regenerative medicine therapies. Um, and to explore opportunities for stakeholders to engage with the FDA and you know, how do we advance these therapies? So it's a, it's a conversation, we present information, we, we typically will have a case study. And so it's an opportunity for people to have a discussion about what, um, what's worked, what, you know, where can we take this in the future? And then there are also um, uh, two, we've had two workshops and we're planning on making it annual now. Um, um, the latest one was, it's sort of a deeper dive. It's more of like a three or four hour dive into, into a topic. And the last one was on natural history studies and how they contribute to improved understanding of diseases and drug developments. Um, and, and of course it was fairly specific to gene therapies there, but natural history studies are something that are common, especially in the rare disease space. Um, and what's interesting about those is we're really, as we're doing these webinars, as we're talking to patients, we're really trying to 
get the ideas for these webinars and workshops from the patient community. What, what is it that they need to know? Where can we provide more understanding so that they can work more effectively with the agency, so that they can work more effectively with sponsors? So um, I just wanted to put that out there. And now I am going, I, I am going to put some links um, in, the, um, in the chat for the, the webinars and the workshops that we've had. And um, I think, um, did, did that answer your question, Ellen? It did, it did, yes. yes. Okay, Thank excellent. You. Thank you. Thank okay, you. great. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna jump ahead to, to a question that I, I wanna pose in front of all, for all of you to think about. And that's, um, you know, what is, you, you've all had now some years of experience with the patient engagement work that you're doing. What has your center or division learned through its patient engagement work that you find most exciting? Um, what learnings do you think that have been game changing? What are the big successes that you've experienced of, over this period of time? So, um, so Robin, I'll start with you. We'll go back to you. We haven't talked to you in a few minutes. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, I think we, we've seen a lot of successes. I mean, I think the, 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 um, the patient focused drug development meetings, we learned so much from them. Um, the reviewers tell us always how much value they find in those. And I think, you know, we've been seeing them shift a, a little bit from, um, the, the, the FDA led to the externally led PFDD meetings. And a lot of those are really happening in, um, in, in conditions that tend to be pretty rare. And we learned so much from them. And I think we were all a little bit concerned, obviously, when we kind of had to switch from these in-person meetings to these virtual meetings. But um, we there, there's still so much great information coming in. I mean, you know, some of these meetings include videos and things. So we can really, really kind of get an understanding of some of these rare conditions and really hear from this breadth of patients because we're now able to kind of reach them not only across the country, but kind of across the world. And so, I mean, I think that our PFDD meetings, I mean, there's a lot of things that we're doing that I think are super exciting. I mean, the guidances are really exciting, but um, and but what we're learning from the PFDD meetings and seeing that kind of take off and these patient groups really kind of um, kind of take them on and provide these amazing meetings are just are just wonderful. So, Sina, how about if we turn to you on, on um, what do you think has been uh, most exciting, game changing successes? I, I know the that you've got the um, the listening sessions going on, and that's probably one of the things, but. I'm sure, I'm sure you have other things that, that you can point to. Yeah, uh, so with the listening sessions, which are kind of informal discussions with the patient groups uh, and uh, our scientific reviewers uh, at, the, at CEDAR, so often it has been heard that FDA staff, they have described these interactions as eye-opening and the listening sessions, they have garnered significant interest within and outside the agency. So information shared has helped the FDA better understand what is important for the patient communities. And the FDA has also used the information to prepare for public meetings and to inform guidance document development, medical product development, and regulatory decision-making. And patients listening sessions, they have also provided opportunities for patient communities to have a seat at the FDA's table. And these, these meetings, as I said, are informal, are non-industry, are non industry is not invited to these meetings. Their intimate nature of the listening session allows the patients and caregivers to feel more comfortable sharing their personal experiences. And this, uh, these um, hearing directly from the patients about their unmet need, about the, uh, the symptoms of their diseases, which are more important for them. And currently, if we do not have any treatment for those, is very important for the reviewers who are directly working on the review work of those uh, products. Terrific, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, you wanna jump in with, um, with from the CEDAR perspective of um, game-changing uh, successes, anything that you think is most exciting about the work over the last few years? Well, you know, from the CEDAR age perspective, I would say, you know, I think, what I've really been excited by is our staff have asked us for engagement activities where they come to us saying, we really wanna hear from patients about this. And that is a shift in the business practice of the agency where it, it really, from the interactions they've had, they've learned so much and now they're asking for it. 
They're including patients in their scientific workshops and public meetings as speakers and panelists sitting side by side other experts like clinicians and developers so that you know, that's an acknowledgement of how important that patient perspective is. That to me is, is game changing, um, yeah. truly. Sure, sure. Karen, anything you want to add to that discussion? I, I agree with all that. And then I would just add how eye-opening it's been to me to see, you know, patients, the ability that they have to move the needle in drug development, a patient advocacy groups, they are so busy doing work in the preclinical phase. They are developing mouse models. Um, they are becoming true partners with industry through developing um, registries and natural history studies. And I think the other thing that's really important is patients sort of understanding the value that they can add to the whole process. And also because, because they own the information that they make, you know, that's, you know, um, it becomes um, it, it becomes available to a lot of people to be able to use, and I think that's really important for patients to understand that you know when they participate and they become the developers of the stuff, it's more likely that they're going to be able to share it with multiple um, programs. Um, whereas if where if if other people are leading, it, it, you know, it might become siloed in some way. And so I think it's very powerful, um, not only how, pay, how FDA has seen patients coming to us, how it shifted our cultural, um, the cultures of our review staff and our cultures here, but also how patients are, are becoming such um, big players in the space, how they're continuing to evolve and sort of rise, rise to the occasion. Uh, thank you. That, that's great. Um, Michelle, I want to go back to you on something that you mentioned in your presentation, which was the kind of that case example of where information that came from patients was actually used in some of the decision making process and, and um, provided uh, as, as part of the um, information that goes out to clinicians and patients. Um, I, I guess I, I think people are looking for some of those um, clear examples of where information that came from patients actually made some type of difference. And so I know you pointed that out. I'd like to get that kind of example from others, if there are any, where that patient engagement information that the, the patient experience data that came out of that interaction, um, we're actually seeing how it made a contribution in some way. Can, can you any of you jump in with some of those kinds of examples of an, an example of the contribution it made? Michelle, you might dive into the one that you were talking about a little bit more. Well, I mean, I, I can I can speak to that one. I can add a different one um, if if you like. I mean, I think um, the the first one that I spoke about was from the Kidney Health Initiative, uh, and they there was a public meeting that FDA was a part of, and they spoke specifically about home hemodialysis devices. And currently, or at that time. Um, they had to be used at home with the caregiver in order for patients who were living with end-stage kidney disease, they would have to have someone present to help them um, do dialysis or purify their blood, which would be done um, at home. And it, it impeded on the ability for them to be independent. I mean, part of their desire to do it at home is to be independent. Um, and they made that statement, um, worked with a, uh, one of the members of the industry to design a patient preference study. FDA also provided feedback through our formal processes and they submitted that data to us that showed that patients were willing to take some on some of these risks for the benefit of being able to do this on their own gives them more independence. And so we took that information as well as other evidence that had already been submitted for that particular device that was on the market, as I said, with a different labeled indication. And we put some mitigations in place to make sure that the device remains safe and effective for patients. But that input is what led to that expanded label indication, which is really, I think, really a testament to the voice of the patient and people listening to it and, and making it actionable. Um, the second thing I would mention is our patient engagement advisory committee. 
Um, last year, we had a meeting on recalls and specifically about how do we communicate about medical device recalls. Now, our regulation around recalls is very complicated, as you know, and it's very specific for medical product centers. So it is not an easy area to navigate. But what we heard very clearly from our members is that we want clear communication. What's actionable? What do we need to do? Um, and we took that input as well as the input they gave us that, you know, patients should give you guys some insights on how you frame some of these responses so that you're meeting their needs too in your communications. And so we took that and talked with patients, shared our messages with them, asked for their feedback and input on that messaging and refined and revised our messaging around a particular highly visible recall based on patient input. So I would say, it's, there's so many examples that it's hard to point to just one or two. I mean, there's a lot, and I'm just speaking up from one product center. Um, and I, I'm sure my colleagues have many stories as well and the ways in which you know, patients have generously given us their input and we have folded that into actionable efforts. Robin, Karen, anything you wanna to add to that? I can I can add to I can add to to that. I think you know there's a few examples, and I don't want to take up like a huge amount of time providing them. But there was um, there was a drug that came in that was um, looking for an indication um, to treat hyperhidrosis or kind of that excessive sweating, and um, and you know we got we got some data in as part of that application that it it was a little bit. Um, the data is a little bit confusing to interpret, particularly um, just because of some of some. It, some of it looked like things were effective. Some of it looked like things weren't effective. And what we realized was that um, what our, what we came came to realize is that we had heard at a PFDD meeting that sometimes hyperhidrosis is not just like an all the time thing, right? So it can be episodic. And so some of the data, some of the the tests were being done at a specific time in the doctor's office on a specific day of the week, these very specific time points, which you don't know if somebody's having kind of like this exacerbation of their, of their, um, of the sweating and things like that. And so it really, that the PFDD meeting really kind of helped to contextualize the data and really kind of help us make sense of, make sense of it. And so there's, there's that kind of example where, you know, just really kind of, and I mean, our clinicians obviously have experience with that, but maybe our statisticians maybe don't have as much of that experience, but had attended the um, the, the patient-focused drug development meeting and really kind of was, were able to kind of apply that. So that was one place where we just, you know, where that was really helpful. Another one, when we're looking at endpoints, I think, you know, um, Hearing, hearing from patients with um, like, especially kids that had liver, liver, liver disease, that itching was a really major effect and that like that um, the itching could um, was like decreased itching was a really significant impact really kind of helped to inform our thinking about maybe what trial endpoints would be would be would be appropriate. And I mean, I think there's other things where we hear from patients about kind of like deal breakers for clinical trial participation. And, you know, we don't always 100% know, um, like, we don't immediately have a solution just because we understand that it's a problem. But sometimes it's nice to just really kind of get an understanding and start thinking about maybe what are what solutions we could kind of be working on to find find things that might be more acceptable to patients or or things like that. And so I think, you know, there's there's just there's a lot of examples where where we're learning things on a regular basis. And maybe you don't immediately see a change because there's not like an immediate fix, but at least it's kind of informing our thinking and kind of how we're moving forward. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Katri, I'm going to turn to you first for this question, but of course anyone can jump in and, and add to, to the response. Um, my question is about sharing and collaboration across the FDA? And how are the different centers um, sharing information about patient engagement and learnings about patient engagement? And, um, and, and are there international efforts with other regulatory agencies to share and collaborate when it comes specifically to approaches to patient engagement? Could, could you start us off on that question? Sure, um, uh, thanks Dr. Uh, Porfido. So in CEDAR, we collaborate mostly with, I um, mean, we do collaborate with other centers, but we work very closely with the Office of Commissioner. In the Office of Commissioners, we have a patient affairs staff, and they also have a similar portal. I shared the link uh, in the chat, 
how people can request meetings with CEDAR, but they have a similar portal where uh, the stakeholders can request meeting with the patient affairs staff. And what their role is to, uh, is to handle cross-center requests. So when the request comes in, they send it to us and we vet it through our CEDAR um, SMEs that if, or the divisions, if they are interested in that particular topic or topic or um, which could be of a cross center interest. So that's how we are collaborating with them, but we do uh, meet with centers and the patient affairs staff on a regular basis. And um, I think I got a question. It's the subject matter experts, the SME I use. Sorry, FDA is known to use all this acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize for that. So it is the subject matter experts. And um, so we do meet regularly uh, with our um, counterparts in the um, in the in very um, in the office of commissioner. Again, the name is patient affairs staff, and uh, we uh, patient affairs staff is usually engaging with our international counterparts, such as Health Canada and also the European Medical Agency, and a reg on a regular basis. Um, and I'll turn it over back any, to you. Any, anyone else want to jump in on that? And especially when it comes to things like um, guidance documents and and uh, I know- so I, so I can talk a little bit about, about um, our work with ICH or the um, International Council on Harmonization, which is um, a, a, a group that really works to try and harmonize um, um, guidance kind of and expectations across across the, the, the world. And I think one of the exciting things that we've done, I want to say it was, I've lost all track of time with the pandemic. So apologies if I'm completely off on, on the, the time frame for this. But I want to say maybe about a year ago, we put out a reflection paper on patient focused drug development as a way to um, as a way to um, really kind of think about harmonizing some patient-focused drug development principles and a little bit more towards like the clinical outcome assessment development and a little bit more um, looking at patient preference study methodologies and things like that. So really more kind of methodologic than kind of philosophical, I guess, is what I would, I would say. And so just to kind of harmonize those expectations. And so we got a lot of really good feedback on that. And um, we anticipate that that will, will be moving forward. Of course, we have people, staff members and such who are participating in a lot of these global efforts. You know, we reach out and we work and I mean, and you know, the IMI prefer work that just came out, we had people kind of like, you know, observing what was going on there. And of course, we have internal meetings, we have, you know, standing kind of patient focused methodologies, meetings that include all of the centers, including, you know, the CDR, CBER, CDRH, the Oncology Center for Excellence, and um, and even outside of kind of the medical product centers. So, so there is a huge amount of collaboration internally and also externally. Terrific, thank you. Anyone else want to add anything to that before we move on to another question? Yeah, I, I'll just also add that you know when when a when a group does come to us and ask to talk to the FDA, whether it's through a listening session or they're um, planning a, a, a PFD, a patient-focused drug development meeting. There are efforts between the people on this call and then other people as well to sort of say like, hey, did you know so-and-so talk to us? Are you interested? And, and hearing what they have to say too. So we really try to make sure that when a group comes to us that everybody has an opportunity to hear from them. Um, you know, it, in a single setting. I mean, there may be times when they have a very specific issue that is specific to a very um, specific to a center, but a lot of the times a CBER issue is a theater issue is a CDRH issue. We all wanna hear what patients have to say. So we try to coordinate in, in that manner. Great, great. The, the only other point that I would mention is that we talk a lot also with um, international regulators. Um, I know that in the device space, we have um, had multiple meetings with. Michelle, you're breaking up a little bit. Your sound has gotten a little funny. So sorry, it's not much. I can, it's my internet, not much I can do, unfortunately. Um, but um, can you hear me better now? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so we work with other international regulators, um, and 
also with our standardizing bodies. There are international as well as national standards organizations that are also considering ways in which the patient perspective can be incorporated into the work that's being done there. So a lot of opportunities to collaborate domestically, internationally, and across different stakeholder groups, including academia, um, as well as other professional and patient organizations. Great, thank you so much. So um, I'm gonna jump to a question that, that talks a little bit more about definitions. Um, does the FDA differentiate between patient engagement and public enga engagement? And how does that happen? Does anybody wanna jump in on that kind of question? I'm happy to start and, and then to my colleagues. So I think when we think of public engagement, that's everybody who's not government, right? It could be clinicians, it can be industry, it can be anyone who's not a government. And that's, that's what we mean by public engagement. But patient engagement is a specific group within the public um, that people who are living with a particular medical condition or maybe utilizing um, a healthcare product. Um, we also understand that some at least in, in our product space, um, pe there are people who are of the public that are not patients. So there's aesthetic devices and other things that people may be using that are not treating a medical condition, but they're still interacting with a medical product. And so, you know, it's, we use both terms to, to help uh, distinguish the differences that, that I'm alluding to. How, how is the engagement different, Michelle, or anyone? How is the engagement activity different? So, I mean, we have, you've heard a lot of the vehicles that we've listed that are specific and unique to patients, um, but there are some vehicles that overlap. Um, the advisory committee vehicle is one that overlaps. There are industry clinicians, statisticians, as well as patients that can be, as Sadna already talked about, special government employees, right? Where they will go through a vetting process, apply to be a member of an advisory committee, and, and then based on whether or not they go through that vetting process and are um, selected to participate as part of it. That's for anyone who's part of an advisory committee. Um, but the patient and caregiver connection, the patient listening sessions, all of those are for patients, not for other members of the public. And it's really a more intimate and selected opportunity for folks to interact with FDA that um, other members of the public may not have. Anyone want to add to that? I'll just add a little bit to what Michelle said, uh, in particularly about the listening sessions. And in listening sessions, as I said, we engage with external stakeholders, and we specifically engage with stakeholders who are not drug companies or product sponsors, and we refer to them as non-sponsor stakeholders through these listening sessions. Great. Terrific. Um, and I, we've had a lot of questions from folks about, um, and I, I have a long litany of questions that really all kind of get to processes and logistics. And I think um, many of these questions are probably been in some way answered in the chat with some of the links that you're providing, but I'm gonna lump all of these together in one question. Um, tell us about the best way to, to be involved um, as a patient in an FDA activity or program. Um, we've heard that one, one person has submitted that some patients go through a screening process and background checks. Um, can you clarify about whether or not that's true? And I think we've heard that certainly there is an application process. I'm not so sure about the background check part of it. But um, could each of you just for a moment touch upon um, how you encourage people to get involved? And I know you've put some links in the chat already. Just point out what those are. So Dr. Khatri, you've, you've done quite a bit of that in terms of um, pointing out some things in the in the um, in the chat for us, just kind of a quick overview. What's the best way if someone's on this uh, Zoom call and they're they're e eager to get involved? What, what's the kind of what's the first thing that they ought to do? So I will specifically focus on what my office does is the listening sessions. And for listening sessions, I as I mentioned earlier, they are informal, non-public, non-advisory exchanges between FDA, CDER staff, and non-sponsor stakeholders. And these listening sessions are small by design to facilitate purposeful engagement and to allow adequate time for each stakeholder to speak. And the sessions are typically about 60 minutes. CEDAR staff are primarily in listen and mode during these meetings. And however, CEDAR staff may choose to ask clarifying questions during these meetings. FDA is not permitted to have more than nine invited organizations 
participating in a listening session, and if more than nine are invited, a federal register notice must be published, allowing the public an opportunity to participate in a planned event. And these listening sessions are not intended to establish policy or binding agreements. The guidelines for the listening sessions, they can include but are not limited to discussions and listening sessions. As I said multiple times, they are informal recommendations and proposals and are non-binding to FDA and to other participants. And patients, patient advocacy groups, they can uh, request a listening session. I have shared a, a link earlier and there are two portals. If they, the listening sessions are drug specific, they can uh, request it to request a, a meeting on drugs. And if it is a cross center request, then they can send it to patient affairs staff. That link is also included in the chat. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that question about just in general? I, I think I would like to, to add that I think, you know, the, the criteria for participating as a special government employee on an advisory committee or something like that um, is a little, you know, I mean, it's the same criteria for all, all special government employees as far as um, ethics and things like that. Um, but for patient focused drug development meetings or other kind of interactions, um, aside from asking people to disclose any potential conflicts of interest we have, we don't need to know your name. We don't think, you know, we don't um, need to know um, anything that you don't want to share share with us. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to for to, for interaction without there needing to be kind of a huge a huge amount of um, information disclosed as well. Thank you. Anyone else? We'll go on to another question because I've got um, one here that's really from the from the company side. Um, it says that there's that this person has observed that there's a lot of interest in patient engagement on the R&D side of a company, but not so much on the commercial side. Um, and so the question is, what might be done to increase interest and understanding on that commercial side of the company? Is there any role that FDA could play in um, maybe enticing the commercial side to be just as engaged in um, in patient engagement as the R&D side is. Thoughts on that or experiences where you've seen some of that? I guess it gets to some idea of what some of those successes look like. If there is a success in some way, then it could encourage some of the commercial side of the company to be more involved or thinking more about it um, uh, because it, it, it's a pull through, right? If you if you have that success on the R and D side, and the product is more, it's is it, uh, could be approved faster or um, improved in some in some way over other products that are out there because of that information. Then that should be a pull through and the realization on the commercial side. I would think. Anyone have any um, experiences in seeing anything like that happen in the past or recently? I mean, I guess I don't. I don't know that we really. Have have a lot to say about how companies commercialize their their products, obviously. Know, yeah. But um, but I mean, I think you know one of the successes that one of the reasons maybe that we've seen success on the R and D side, in addition to the fact that it's like better science, right, is that there has been some research done and published. Um, Kind of in on the on the industry side about the the benefits of of the patient focused drug development, and I think um, you know, and I think you know, we're seeing that this in that there's financial savings as well when you're talking about maybe being able to recruit more quickly. You're able to you know retain more patients, so you have less missing data, so that you're able to um, you know have less protocol amendments, and all of these things are are beneficial. And so I think there's there it's twofold. Like one, you're developing a better product, but two, you're also seeing that like your investment is kind of paying off as as well. And so I would assume that. Um, you know, if there was data like that, and I would rely on obviously the, the our industry colleagues to kind of develop that. But if there was data like that, that would be potentially a motivator. And, and I would also think that if information was captured from patients early on that got incorporated into an R&D program, um, that that would be the same kind of information that the commercial side of the company would want to use in terms of um, highlighting what the attributes are of that product, because it is responsive to patient needs. So that could be a big plus. It may just be a, an educational component that the commercial side um, just needs to understand better what, 
what all of this really is. Uh, another part of that question was um, what are the requirements for companies to engage patients and how might or could companies be held accountable? Um, there's new guidance out and I'm, I'm assuming in this question that they were referring to the new draft PFDD guidance because it is only within the last month or so that, that that third one has come out. So that's made me assume that that's the guidance that they're talking about, but I know there are certainly other guidances that are coming out of the FDA all the time. Um, but under this, because there is this new guidance, how might companies be held somewhat accountable for um, what, what the requirements might be? So um, Robin, what would you speak to that since the guidance I know is a CEDAR guidance? Well, so it's a CEDAR, CDRH, CBER guidance. Oh, okay. We, I, this, is, this is very exciting for us. We've actually, this is one of those uh, cross-center collaborations we were talking about, about mm -hmm. earlier. So, I mean, I still will speak to it, but just so you know. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that, I think, and I, I'm really talking about my, myself personally. I think that, you know, I think there's great value in, in, patient engagement and patient focused drug development. And as I mentioned, like, you know, they're throughout the, being involved throughout the drug development process. And I think that we see that companies that engage in this and really meaningfully engage in it, not, you know, do the checkbox type thing, but, um, but actually meaningfully engage in patient engagement, really see the benefits of it. And so I think what we're, we're seeing is that this is an evolution. This is a culture change, but that People, more and more, it's becoming, becoming kind of part of the culture of organizations. And so I, I personally don't feel that we need like the stick because I think the carrot of the greatness of patient engagement and patient, and patient involvement in the drug development process is, is enough. And to be honest with you, I'm not really sure like what that would look like if it was to become mandated, if it would just be like people would phone it in and it wouldn't be meaningful anyway, but it would still create burden for patients. And so I think we really want people to want to meaningfully engage. Um, I'm going to uh, jump to another question that is um, a kind of a, a, a jumble of a lot of different questions um, that have come through. And it gets to um, how can the, or what role does the FDA have in terms of the kind of information and materials that go out to patient in terms of how um, uh, readability for, or, or understandability for patients who maybe have um, some kind of communication limitations, maybe um, vision problems, hearing problems, um, things that would be uh, the, the right uh, literacy levels that patients will understand. Um, there's concern that um, the, some of the documents that get put, get, get put in front of patients, especially those that might be participating in clinical trials, consent forms, those kinds of things, um, that, that they're really um, burdensome or maybe not appropriate for patients. And we still haven't achieved that yet. So kind of, what kind of role could patient engagement play in helping to resolve some of those issues? And what, what um, role or input do your centers have in some of those kinds of things? You know, this issue of accessibility, but also the linkage between accessibility with the role patient engagement could have. Start off, and I'm not as close to clinical trials as maybe Robin and Michelle are, and, and um, just in my uh, looking back in my career, but I think what we hear a lot from patients is um, about what it's like to be in a clinical trial and the things that they need to know. We also start to understand the language that they use to describe um, their experiences. And I think that patient engagement may be able to help sponsors start to incorporate that language, start to incorporate that, um, you know, what they're hearing about patients about clinical trial experience into how they communicate about it, how they develop consent. Um, I mean, I could go, I, if I were to go further, I, I, I don't think I'd be speaking very, um, from a lot of um, basis of experience. So I'm gonna sort of turn it over to my colleagues who are, as always, a lot smarter than I, so. 
Well, I, I would, I would, say, you know, I'm an ophthalmologist by training, and so a lot of the resources that I share with certain patients have to do with um, opportunities for them to. Um, uh, leverage some of the accessibility tools visually to help them participate and complete some of their tasks. And I will say that for um, we are increasingly seeing more and more digital health technologies come into the marketplace to help capture that patient experience. And there are some laws that require certain accessibility features for those technologies. Um, there's also um, the opportunity to leverage those features so that patients are better able to participate in the clinical trial enterprise, whether it be from electronic um, clinical outcome assessments that can be pushed through um, a smartphone and they can make adaptations so that they can actually uh, contribute and that will allow them to participate in the, in the clinical trial. Um, there are also so many more um, modifications that are being made um, to different um, technologies that allow patients to more meaningfully contribute. And you probably have seen one of the guidances that came out, uh, I wanna say in the, spring on how digital health technologies can be helpful in remote clinical trial conduct. And, and this is another opportunity for patients who may not have the ability to participate because of physical limitations to more meaningfully contribute to clinical trials um, given this, these new technologies. So I would say that to that point, there are more and more uh, ways in which patients may be able to contribute given technology improvements. Yeah, and, and I'll just comment on, on one experience that I've had with um, some, some uh, patients who were going through um, an entry, in, it was a mock uh, day, entry into a clinical trial where the patients were going through what they would have gone through if they were entering that clinical trial on the first day, but, but the testing wasn't really done. It was a mock exercise. And it, the purpose of it was to get in, um, input from the patients about how they reacted to that first day because it was a pretty intensive day. And at the end of the day, the patient's complaints were ranged from too many laboratory tests, uh, you know, having a, a spinal tap, all of these things that were going on, and that the, the paperwork was, not, was too burdensome and not understandable. And so having more of those kinds of patient engagement activities as part of the process gets the feedback back to the company that they have to change some of these things. And in that particular case, they actually change the protocol pretty significantly. So I think that's one way that patient engagement can help with some of these things. Robin, did you have something to add? I, I did. I just wanted to, to add two, two things. One, I think like your, your last point was, um, was, was super, super critical, which is, you know, the more we see patients being involved throughout the drug development process, the more we see that there, there's an opportunity to kind of ensure that the study materials are, are understandable. And there are a good number of organizations um, and researchers who are really have kind of these groups, almost like focus groups set up to kind of like patient groups set up pa of patient advisors to participate in like in, in these processes. And I mean, you know, compensated members of the team type thing, but like t like part groups to really provide this feedback so that these materials being developed are are accessible. And then also, I just wanted to mention that um, patient focused drug development guidance number two does talk about um, considering barriers to participation and and things like that. So I would also point you toward towards that as far as actual barriers towards participation. Thanks. Yeah, um, I, I also wanted to point out that one of the um, one of the listeners on this program today um, wanted to provide some information about kind of that return on investment um, uh, on patient engagement, and so she provided a link, and that came from someone who's uh, not one of the speakers. Uh, there was an interesting question that's that's come up, and um, I, I want to figure out how to frame this. How does a company, or a, a pharma company, or a device company, how do they um, kind of gain access to some of this information that might come from your listening sessions or um, a, a voice of the patient meeting. How do they align that with how they choose their endpoints in a clinical trial? Is there a way that they can talk to the FDA about some things we heard or that we read in a voice of the patient meeting? Um, how might that be incorporated into the decision making for choosing endpoints? Could someone talk a little bit about how that how, the, how you've seen that process work out? I mean, are, are you seeing that what you're, what's being learned in a voice of the patient meeting is actually being reflected in newer endpoints in clinical trials because of some thinking about 
patient engagement or whether it's from a voice of the patient report or whether it's from their own interactions with patients with the disease that they're focused on, um, that you're seeing this evolution now in the way that endpoints are selected and how, how do you see that there's alignment and, and discussion that might happen with the FDA to get that alignment? I'll, I'll just sort of tell you what I'm hearing from my side and, and I have very limited experience with sort of on the sponsor side, but what I am hearing from my people, my colleagues who do work with sponsors is, is that they are looking for this information. They are looking for the summaries. They are looking for the voice of the patient reports and they're looking for them early in the process because that informs their discussions with the sponsors. And so they are wanting to get that information um, in those early discussions um, when sponsors are first coming to us and saying, we want, you know, we, we want to do, you know, we're thinking of this clinical trial. And, and so when those discussions start, they're like, well, you know, here's what we've heard from the patients and, and, and sort of trying to work that into the discussions. I can't speak much from the other side because that's just not my sort of that's not sort of my sort of path that brought me here. And so I don't have that much experience, but I will tell you that I am finding it. I am hearing from my colleagues that it is important from our side in the discussions with the sponsors. And I would just build on what Karen says. I mean, I think that, you know, we've been, we've been holding these patient focused drug development meetings for a while. Obviously patient um, engagement has been going on for significantly longer, um, but you know, I think there's there's some challenges. Obviously, we're we're hoping for as much transparency as as we can, and we certainly do have discussions about endpoints with sponsors and things like that. Um, of course, you know, one of the challenges that I think FDA runs into frequently is that you know we're not able to talk about drug development programs that are that are in process, right? Like there's a lot of proprietary confidential information. So we can't really necessarily discuss a lot of the things that um, we're seeing that are not part of kind of an approved application. And so there's always gonna be kind of like this lag time between what we're doing and what people are, are seeing. But I do think that, you know, more and more we're, we're seeing, um, you know, the, the, these discussions about what really matters to patients as far as what's being measured in trials. But at the same time, there are a lot of things that matter to patients that are really important, really critical, but maybe aren't appropriate for measuring in a clinical trial, or we don't think that they're going to change over the duration of a clinical trial. And so, so, you know, just because something matters, and of course it matters, doesn't make it always like the best trial end point. And so it's, it's kind of, kind of a balance, right? So there's another question that's sort of related to this discussion that I'll throw out there. And it's, um, if a company has been doing some patient engagement and they've used that information to incorporate into a development program, how, how do they, how do they tell you about that? How do they present that to you to demonstrate that they've done the work and that they've made some decisions based on what they learned? Um, how do they tell you about it? I have thoughts on this that I want to give my, my, I've been talking too much. So I want to give my, uh, my colleagues the opportunity to, to say something first. <laughs> I mean, we often will see it in the submission, to be completely honest. Um, you will see a statement where the industry may have said, we got input from patients. This is what they've told us. This is how it's impacted our protocol design or our study endpoints or our prioritization or hierarchy scheme, the statistical analysis plan. So all of that is often included in the submission. You know, um, that's usually how we hear about it. Sometimes it's in press releases when they are uh, <laughs> announcing the decision for the product. So, so, so let's flip you that know, question a little bit. What's your preference about how you'd like to see it? I don't think we have a preference. No. I think we're just happy that people are considering the patient's perspective in the process. Yeah. Um, it, as you know, that. it's voluntary. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it's voluntary, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. we don't mandate it. Um, and when people are of their own volition saying this is important, I'm going to include it, I'm going to announce it and make it transparent to others, I think that's a win. Um, so um, I think I, I don't have a preference. I don't know if my colleagues have a preference, but uh, I, I do think that's it's just important that they do it. Yeah, and I agree with Michelle that it's really important. And um, in um, my space in the organization I am in, we do not work with the sponsors. So as I said, that we work with non-sponsors, which are non-industry stakeholders. But um, 
I concur with my colleagues what they had said earlier. That is really important and we're really happy that they are considering patient input and it is important for them. So I, I agree with everything that was said to 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 a point, but I think you know sometimes we see these patient experience dossiers that are like thousands and thousands and thousands of pages, and it involves kind of every time somebody talked to a patient. And I think there's a huge amount of really important information that informs the clinical trial design or informs kind of the development of the documents, like we've been talking about. That is really important information, but it doesn't necessarily um, need to be part of a new drug application unless it informs like an important decision that you think FDA is going to ask ask questions about. Um, so with that being said, I think it's always helpful if somebody is submitting this patient experience dossier type thing to make sure that it tells kind of a meaningful story of kind of how we get got from point A to point B, not just kind of a check, check. conglomeration <laughs> of like every every patient interaction that, that was had. So I mean, and I that, that is my opinion. I am not necessarily speaking as official FDA policy, but I think that, you know, the more, the easier you can make it for people to kind of understand the point that you're trying to, to make, the, the better it is. Tell the story well, would, clearly and cohesively with evidence, with data. I would definitely second that. We have various mechanisms at our various centers, though. So we don't have a patient experience dossier at CDRH. And that's partially why I said, I like to hear about what you're doing. But as Robin alluded to, how does it impact our decision making, right? How is it going to be useful for the reviewers that are looking at the data? That's what we want to put it in context and it should be fit for purpose. Um, you know, uh, we've had uh, conversations with sponsors who may be doing something, but it's not fit for the purpose in which they would like to use it. So I think having those early meaningful conversations with us at the outset is helpful in shaping what that patient uh, engagement activity or patient study patient preference or PRO, whatever study they would like, patient reported outcome, sorry, development process they'd like to engage on, what they want to do with it. And that can help inform and make their efforts um, Im impactful. Um, I'm going to um, stop the discussion conversation in the Q&A now. And um, I'm, I'm not throwing the speakers a curveball. They were warned ahead of time that I was going to ask them and kind of do a, a round with them on what are the, what kind of what closing remarks would they like to make um, to uh, to kind of end the session with some final comments? Um, and I want to warn them that that's coming up in just a minute. But we also had a question that I think is a very important one that I want to tackle. But I'm going to give you a little time to think about your last remark while we talk about this other question, and that has to do with ensuring equitable patient input engagement representation. And so I know that that's been something that's been um, a high priority for the FDA over the last few years um, in ensuring that there's diversity and equity. So would someone comment about um, how we think about that in terms of patient engagement? Robin, I, oh, excuse me, um, Jack, uh, Karen, I know you've been involved in some of this and some of the work that you've been doing. So Karen, I'm gonna I, turn to you. Yeah, I was, up to, I, was, I was about ready to chime in because actually uh, Dr. Perfetto and I, we've been, um, uh, on, a, on a project where we're collaborating with some folks at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy on a on, on you know bringing greater equity into patient engagement and uh, we're kind of the space that we're looking at right now is it's actually it's a food allergy um, a couple of years ago FDA approved a uh, a tree uh, a what's it, I guess it's a treatment for for peanut allergy and. From you know, food allergy is actually very equitable in, in terms of who it affects. But when we kind of looked at who was coming to the FDA and telling us what they kind of valued and, and, and how much they really wanted to see this product be approved. And we also sort of looked at who participated in the clinical trials, it didn't really reflect who, you know, it didn't really reflect who we were hearing from. It didn't reflect the patient population. And so that sort of got us to thinking, what can we do to, you know, what are, the, in the pathway to the FDA and through these different channels and sort of, and the, and the sort of the people they might go through to the FDA, what are the barriers and what are the opportunities to create 
greater opportunities in, in, um, for, for whoever um, to come and tell us there about um, what's important to them in a treatment. And so we're sort of in the middle of it right now, but we are talking to patient advocacy organizations in the, in the, in the um, food allergy space. We're talking to patients themselves in the food allergy phase who have, who have, who identified themselves as having a food allergy and saying, you know, do you even, you know, do you even know what, what the FDA is? Do you know about allergy treatments? What, you know, what do you think about that? You know, how do you, how do you access them? So just trying to learn more about what, you know, what is the pathway to the FDA and how can we make that easier and how can we open those channels up so that people are more, people of, of, there's greater equity. Um, I'm not going to say it's not equitable, but how so that more people feel comfortable coming to the FDA, more people are able to um, access these different channels. And so to sort of- And the pathway at, is more well-known. And the pathway is more path. well-known. Sorry. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I don't want to say I was sort of, the phrasing was a little awkward there, but you know, how can, the, the whole idea is that we're not seeing, we're not always seeing people come to us that really reflect the, the population of people who, who are affected by the disease or condition. And we need to do something about that. And that's that, I'm just taking a small first step of trying to figure out what it might look like. Thank you, thank you. So, so to wrap up the session, I want to turn to each of you and give you a a, a final word. So, um, Sadna, I'm going to begin with you. Sure, thank you, and I will just uh, say thank you to each and every one of you. It has been really a very uh, healthy discussion. Discussions about the different options from my colleagues you heard at different centers, and in the end, I will just say a few words, which will be that at FDA, we highly value patient engagement and its contributions to the development of drug products. And please, we want to hear from you. So thank you for having me here. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Perfetto. <laughs> thank you. Uh, 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 Karen, you wanna come go next? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that's really important to me and one of the things that I when I talk to patient groups, a lot of patient groups will come to me just to say, how do I work with the FDA and what are the channels? And one of the things that I think is really important as a patient group, before you go to the Office of Public Affairs, before you click on that link, think about what your goals are um, in patient engagement. Um, there are a lot of channels at the FDA to engage with us, but I, I, I really, um, counsel patient groups to not treat them as check marks. Each one has its pros and cons. Each one is going to help, may help you solve a particular issue that you're wrestling with better than another. And I think as all of us are dealing with limited resources in terms of time and trying to get people's attention, I think it's really important for a patient group to um, think about what's going to be um, the best channels for them. Also to think about, to take a look at the space around them, see who else is working in this in that space that they can partner with um, um, and come to, you know, try to come to us together if you can. I think there's always strength in numbers. Um, you get better reach. We hear from more people when you work with different patient groups. So my sort of partying, um, Parting message is to um, be very goal oriented when you're engaging with the FDA. Good advice, Michelle. I think um, you know my colleagues have said very clearly things and points that that um, I think we're all thinking. About you're you're actually breaking up a little bit again. Okay, can you hear me 
better. Maybe go to someone else and come back. Robin, Robin why don't you go next? Then we'll go back to Michelle. <laughs> I think only someone else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think what Karen said is really is a really really critical point because we do want to hear hear from patients and the interactions are really important. But I think sometimes people come to FDA because they feel like they should come to FDA. And not necessarily um, because they have like a specific goal in mind. And I think sometimes people walk away a little bit disappointed because they had kind of expectations for the interaction and maybe those those weren't met. And sometimes that's just because like we didn't really, you know, we weren't really clear. You weren't you weren't clear. We weren't clear on kind of what the goal of the interaction was, what we, what we were really hoping as an outcome. Maybe we didn't have um, the necessary information. Maybe it's a little bit too early. You're thinking about doing something, but you don't have enough details for us to kind of react to. So I think, you know, interaction is super important and super, I mean, it's, it's really, it's really critical, but being kind of purposeful in when you do it and how you do it is really, I think, is really, is really key so that it's a good use of your time as well, because the last thing we want is for people to kind of walk away being like, well, I don't know what that was, because I think that's, you know, that, that's really frustrating. So, so thanks. Michelle, let's see if your sound is any better. All right, my fingers are crossed. Am I clearer oh, now? You're clear now, yeah. Okay. All right, excellent. I would say, you know, in light of what you've heard, I think it's also important to understand that because you don't see something immediately doesn't mean we're not doing something for what you told us. Um, some the the gears of government move slowly sometimes. And you know, I told you about the patient engagement advisory committee meeting in 2017, and the final guidance went out this year. Long time. But all of those recommendations, we are listening. Sometimes we can't do what you'd like us to do, um, despite you know, what you may be interested in. And sometimes we are, we're doing it. It just takes us some time. So we ask for patience and understanding and understanding that we're also gathering a lot of stakeholder input um, from different patient groups because not all patient groups have the same objective. Um, and so we've got to take the total body of information and make decisions. So really appreciate you all thinking, uh, inviting us and listening to our, our perspectives and including us in this important conversation. Well, I really want to thank our wonderful panel. I, I had um, started off by calling this the all-star panel and, and um, that's certainly what it is. So thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. We appreciate all of the um, the insights that you've provided. And I want to thank the audience for joining us today and being very active in the chat, being ever very active in the q and I'm sorry that we could not get to all questions. And um, I, think, uh, I think we've already asked Joe if he would capture in some way all those links that are in the chat so that we can make those available um, in some kind of coherent format so people can see what that is. Um, and we can in some way attach that or put it in the same location where we will put this uh, recorded video when it's done. So again, um, everyone, uh, please help me in saying thank you to the um, to, our, to our speakers by, um, by giving them a little clap signal or whatever we have in the, in the Zoom format. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.